welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. And tonight the title of the message is Grace Waste. Grace Waste. Now before we find out what that means, we, we've got to first find out what does grace mean? Uh, you know, if, you, if you've been around church any while, you might have heard a couple different definitions of grace that maybe you understood or maybe you didn't understand or maybe you thought you understood. But, you know, you, you might have heard this one, unmerited favor. And, and grace definitely is unmerited favor. You couldn't do anything to earn it. You, you were helpless in your sin and therefore it was an unmerited favor. It was a gift, a free gift of God's grace that was given to you and I. Here's another definition of grace. It's kind of a fun one, and it uses each letter in the word grace, and it's God's riches at Christ's expense. That's a pretty neat definition because it's easy to remember. If you remember how to spell grace, you'll remember God's riches at Christ's expense. And definitely it is that, once again. We know that, that God's riches, the riches of his glory, the, his fullness, we have received. Now we are partakers of the divine nature, God's riches. And it was at Christ's expense. We couldn't pay for it. We couldn't work for it. We, we, we couldn't do anything to obtain it. God had to reach out to us through this avenue of grace and get a hold of our lives, pull us up out of the mire and the clay, and God had to set our feet upon a rock. So yes, unmerited favor, yes, God's riches at Christ's expense. But the problem comes when you read verses that say that I, I labored more abundantly, abundantly than they all, the Apostle Paul speaking about the other apostles. And he says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. So wait a second, if, if he was laboring and working, and grace was laboring and working in him, was that just God's riches at Christ's expense that was laboring? Was that unmerited favor that was laboring? So we see that grace is obviously more than just God's riches at Christ's expense, more than unmerited favor. It goes beyond salvation, and it goes into our daily walk as a Christian. So at this church, we have a, a, a couple definitions as well of grace. You may know this one, grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. If you know it, say it with me. Come on, grace, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it do it. You see, grace is that ability within us that God grants to us to work and to do things that we couldn't normally do. Salvation, for instance. We couldn't save ourselves. We were powerless. We couldn't go to the cross. We messed up. We weren't spotless. We weren't sinless. So the grace of God has appeared, and now the grace of God reaches out to us, gets a hold of us, and by faith, we latch onto that grace, and now the ability of God where we couldn't do it, we couldn't save ourselves. Now grace gives us that ability, and grace, now by faith, we are saved, right? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians chapter 2. See, we didn't have the ability, but God's ability got the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. How about struggling with sin? All of our life we just walked in sin, we lived in sin, and then we couldn't do anything about sin. But when we got saved, we realized, man, I'm, I'm still dealing with this flesh body. But now grace, the book of Titus tells us, teaches us to say no to ungodliness. That means that where we couldn't do it before, we would be tempted and we would enter into all sorts of stuff. Now the grace of God has appeared to all men and it teaches us to say no. It gives us the ability where we were powerless now to do what we couldn't do. Here's another definition that we have that, that uh, Pastor Deborah gave to us that grace is God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. Let me say that again. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. So we know that grace is power. Grace is ability. Grace is the sovereign divine ability of God. This is, this is the power of God, that dynamite explosive power that we receive when we get saved. But it's so much more than just salvation. No, it goes into every area of our life. It goes into our purity. It goes into our holiness. It goes into our goodness, our good works that we do out of a heart and a love for God and for people. God empowers us by his grace. So now why the message grace waste. Well, we each and every one of us inside of us have a potential to succeed. And along with that, if we waste the grace of God that's within us, we have a potential to fail. But if you didn't know that, if you thought that God was just going to do everything for you, you might be getting kicked around, might be walking around, might be going through some trials and some things like that and wondering what's going on. 
and saying, where's God? What, what's happening to me? What, why is this taking place in my life? And the reason is, is because we have a potential, each and every one of us as Christians, to receive the grace of God and either neglect it, distort it, some would even pervert it, some would misuse the grace of God, and we see this in the words. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Let's take a look at it together. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to take a look at verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 says, We then, as workers together with him, notice there's a capital H there, and that's speaking about God. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, what is he saying? Well, let's start out with the first part of that verse. He says, we then, as workers together with him. When you get saved, now all of a sudden you become a worker in God's field. You are now somebody who is out there doing the work of God. You are a full-time minister in God's eyes. It doesn't matter if you're getting paid by the church or not. You now have a purpose in life. You have a job. You have something that you are planning and that you are preparing, that you are doing. You are sowing, and there is a harvest that you are also reaping. There are things that God has called each and every one of us to do. And so now we work. We labor. We, we, we do a work of faith, and we do the purpose and the plan of God in our life. But we're not alone in this. The good news is, is that God has given us grace. So now we are workers together with him. But he goes on to say this. We also plead with you. In other words, we beg you. We're asking this of you. We're, 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 we're really concerned about this in your life. Now let's take this a step further. This is not just the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church. This is God the Father through the Holy Spirit who has contained this word for thousands of years, speaking to you and I tonight in this house, in this day. And can you imagine if you were sitting at home and you were there in your living room flipping through the channels on TV and suddenly God appeared to you in the middle of the room. Now, after you picked yourself up off the floor, you would probably say, Lord, what, what are you doing? What is it? What is it that you want, Lord? And you would bow down before him and you would worship at his feet. And he would say... I have something very important to, to, to ask of you. And just, yes, anything. Anything, God. I'll do anything, Lord. Now think about if God suddenly got down on his knees and said, I beg you. I plead with you. I, I, I'm asking you earnestly. I, I, I'm begging this of you. You'd probably say, well, Lord, what are you doing on your knees? Get up. You don't have to beg me. Just tell me the command, Lord. Anything, I'll do it. And what does he say? He says, I beg of you, I plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In other words, what does vain mean? Well, here's, here's some words that it means. Ineffective, unproductive, worthless, hopeless, unsuccessful, and futile. In other words, we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God ineffectively, not to receive the grace of God unproductively, not to receive the grace of God and have it be futile or an empty pursuit in your life. I, I love how the Strong's defines this from the Greek. It, it means empty, vain, devoid of truth. See, when you get the truth of God on the inside of you, you, you also get the power of God, the grace of God along with that truth. God will see to his word to perform it. And, and, and the grace of God is God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. So if we're not going to receive the grace of God in vain, that means that that truth will empower us. The grace of God will empower us and it will be filled with the goodness of God. Talking about places or vessels which contain nothing of people who are empty handed or here's one without a gift. Did you know the root word for spiritual gifts in the Bible is charisma, which also has the word charis, which is grace. A spiritual gift is a grace-empowered gift in your life. So if you receive the grace of God in vain, then you can't flow with the spiritual gifts of God. Empty-handed, without a gift. 
Isn't that interesting? Speaking of, uh, of things destitute of spiritual love, one who boasts of his faith as transcendent possession, yet is without the fruits of faith. Wow, I like that. Uh, speaking of endeavors or labors or acts which result in nothing, vain and fruitless and without effect of no purpose. See, there's a reason why God has given you and I the grace of God. Yes, God wants us to be saved, but God doesn't want us to stop there. He doesn't want us to receive the grace of God in vain. God doesn't want ineffective and unproductive Christians. No, God wants you and I to take a hold of the grace of God, put it to work in our lives, and use it for his glory. Amen. Amen. Some people trust in themselves. Some people trust in religion. Some people trust in systems. Some people are comfortable with the ceremonies or, or the rituals, and, and, they, and they stay in those avenues. If I can just do this, if I can just stay here, if I can just show up, if I can just read this, or if I can just pray this, if I can, and, and they get into these habits and these systems. And the Bible speaks about it in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 21. If you have a, a, a King James Version, the old KJV, all right, anybody got the old, anybody old school in here, KJV? All right, a couple of you guys. You, you can read along in your Bibles. So I'm going to put it up on the overhead for, for those of us with the NKJV or, or, or the NIV or any of those other translations you may have. But Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, in the old King James Version says this. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. There's that word vain again. So what is he saying? He's saying, if this is all about a system, if this is all about a ritual, if this is all about a tradition or a ceremony, then the, why did Christ go to the cross? That would be empty, ineffective, and unproductive. But the fact is, is that Christ did go to the cross, and therefore, you and I having that resurrection power resident within each and every one of us as Christians, we need to work with the grace of God. We need to be empowered and flow with the gift of God that's within us. When we don't, it's frustrating. Frustrating the grace of God. You ever had a, a, a friend and you call that friend on the phone and say, hey, what's up? We're going to the movies. Want to meet us down, down you know, let's, let's go hit up Kikorian, man. Let's go hit up Redlands. And they're like, all right, uh, uh, hold on, hold on. What, what time do you want to be there? Well, um, you know, we were thinking about seeing the, the, the 5 o'clock show. We don't want to be there too late. You know, we'll catch some dinner, and then we'll go see the 5 o'clock show. And they're like, I can't do 5. got to do 7. So you're like, all right, all right. Well, uh, you know, there's not really a 7 o'clock show there. It doesn't start till 9. That's a little bit too late for me. So, so I, I, I tell you what, we'll, can, you, can you make it down to, to Ontario? We'll go hit up Ontario then. And they say, oh, yeah, all right, I'll meet you down in Ontario, 7 o'clock. Perfect. All right, cool. So you go, you eat some dinner, you, you, you drive down there, and you get in line, you're waiting at the, at the ticket thing, and you're saying, where's my friend at? What's going on here? And, and, and so you get up to the front, and you buy your ticket, and you, and you text them, you want, you want me to pick you up a ticket? And they say, no, I'm on my way. I'm okay. It's all good. Be there in a minute. Okay, all right. So you get in the theater, you get your popcorn, your red vines, your soda, all that, right? Your raisinets. And, and, and you go and you sit down and, and you're hanging out. You're waiting for the movie to start. Previews start. Uh-oh, previews. So, so you text them again. Where are you at? The previews are starting. And, oh, it's all good. I, I'm on my way. Don't worry about me. You just have fun. I'll be there in a minute. Okay. And so you start to, uh, you know, get into the movie. The title sequence starts. And you're, and you're just kind of sweating, looking at the doors. Where are they at? Where are they at? Movie comes. Movie goes. Last credits roll. They're still not there. You get out of the movie theater, and this time you're not texting them anymore. No, you're going to call them, and you're going to give them a piece of your mind, right? You call them up, and you just get a hold of them. Hey, where you at? Oh, I'm sorry. I just got caught up, and then a friend of mine called, and they, they wanted to hit up Krikorian, so I went down there to, Krikor to, to Krikorian. Frustrating. See, God wants to work with us. God wants us to show up. God wants us on assignment. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a, a destiny for you and I. God has a timing. And God wants us 
to get a hold of his divine appointments. God wants us to walk in conjunction with him. God wants us to, to walk with him, to work with him. And so God is saying, I've got a purpose for your life. I've got uh, an appointment for you. I've got an assignment for you. I need you to show up because when you don't, it's frustrating. I do not frustrate the grace of God. When you go after something else, ceremonies, traditions, rituals, that's frustrating to the grace of God. Why? Because it's not about any of those things. It's about the power of the Lord Jesus Christ within us. If we continue on this path, well, let's just talk about this because it is contained in the Word. The Word contains some scary stuff if you get into it. And I'm not here to scare you tonight. I'm here to encourage you tonight. So, so I'll scare you a little bit and then I'll start encouraging. No, I'm just kidding. But the potential is there. Remember, we talked about potential. Just like there's the potential to receive the grace of God in vain, of no effect, empty, futile. There's also the potential for you and I to frustrate the grace of God. Now, frustration is one thing, but if you continue on that path, we have the potential to fall from grace. You're there in Galatians. Uh, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse number four, the Galatian church had gone after traditions, after ceremonies. The, these people called the Judaizers came in. They were wanting all the men to get circumcised. They were wanting them to hold to the law. And Paul is just hot, like you could crack an egg and fry it on his forehead. He is just mad, and, and you can almost hear him as he's dictating this letter, just pounding the table and, and just giving them everything he's got. He's spitting. Veins are probably popping out of his neck as, as he's dictating this letter. And listen to what he says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. He says, you will become estranged from Christ. In other words, if you receive the grace of God and then you go after dead religion and tradition and ceremonies, now you've become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. Look at what he says. You have fallen from grace. See, if grace is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you and I can't do it, that means that when you're at the end of your rope, that the grace of God is his rope. And don't you know God has a lot more rope? But when you come to the end of your rope and you had your hand on his rope, if you let go of the rope, you've become estranged and you're going to fall. Why? Because your rope won't make it. We've got to get the grace of God in our lives. Now, we talked about the people perverting and distorting the grace of God. People who, who continue to fall from grace and people who continue down these paths, uh, some of them eventually use an opportunity for the flesh. And there are people out there who are distorting the grace of God. They're saying, doesn't matter how you live, doesn't matter what you do, grace will take care of it, don't worry about it. You know, love wins and everybody's gonna get to go to heaven. Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you believe. You, you know, God did his thing on the cross and it's all inclusive. Therefore, everybody's going to heaven. You never have to pray, you never. Listen, that's a distortion and a perversion of the grace of God. And that is something that God takes very seriously. Uh, second last book in the Bible, book of Jude. Little, little book. Book of Jude. Jude starts out telling uh, the people that he's writing to, I wish I could have written to you guys about our common salvation. I was, I'm, I'm excited about what's going on. Really excited about all this stuff. But he says, I can't. Verse number four. Why can't he? Jude, verse 4, says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men. Now look at what he says about these ungodly men. Who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I really wanted to write to you guys about our common salvation. I, I was really excited about that. I, I, I'm, I'm just full of joy, and, and, and the salvation of God is just such an amazing thing. But listen, there are people who have crept in, ungodly men, who have turned the grace of God, this amazing, wonderful thing that God has granted to each and every one of us, and they've turned it into lewdness. My goodness. The picture you get of lewdness, lewd acts, is, is, is perversity. Something that's just distasteful. Something that, that we would all be ashamed to even speak of. And they deny the only Lord God and our Lord, Jesus Christ. So we can't have a grace waste 
in our life. This is a serious offense to the Holy Spirit. Take a look at it in Hebrews chapter 10. I know we're kind of bouncing around tonight. We'll, we'll land in a minute. Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews chapter 10, remember these, these ungodly men who were distorting the grace of God and turned it into lewdness. Remember what they did. They denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll take a look at what happens to those people. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 29. How much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? See, when we receive the grace of God in vain and it has no effect in our life, and we frustrate the grace of God continually, willfully, eventually we could fall from grace and we could distort or turn the grace of our God into something that it should never be, which is lewdness. And that is an insulting thing to the spirit of grace. This is how serious this is. You and I have to get a hold and, and, and not waste the grace of God in our lives. We've got to get going with this thing called grace. We, we've, got to, we've got to use every gift, every avenue that God has placed in our hearts and lives. We've got to be instantly obedient to the Spirit of God. When, when He calls and when He puts you on assignment, I was talking to my wife, she said the other night, she was just up in the middle of the night and she said, okay, Lord, come on. Just, just speak to me. See, what is that? That's being attentive and listening for the voice of God. You and I have got to use everything that God has given to us. Moments when we, we would have thought something else. No, now we're attentive to grace. Attentive to the things of God. So how do we halt the grace waste. See, it'd be one thing to tell you that there could be a grace waste. Quite another thing to tell you how we halt the great grace waste. Uh, one, one preacher said, I cut you open, now I'm going to show you all back up, all right? So, so, so let's do that tonight. How do we halt this? How do we stop this progression? How do we halt the grace waste? A couple of things that I believe that you and I can look at tonight. That if we get these things incorporated into our lives, we're not going to have to worry about frustrating the grace of God. Not going to have to worry about falling from grace. Oh, I wonder if I did or I didn't. No, listen, you get a hold of these things. You're going to be holding on tight to the grace of God, using it and operating it in your lives. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'm glad that two of you on the front row are. How about the people in the back rows? Are you all ready for this? Yeah. There you are. Praise God. How do we halt the grace waste? Number one is in humility. Humility. What is humility? Is it being low to the ground? Is it debasing yourself or beating yourself up? I, I'm, I'm so humble. Look how humble I am. Listen, that's a bunch of humble. <laughs> True humility is total, utter dependence on God. Where you recognize and you realize, I can't do anything on my own. I have got to have the grace of God. This is not about me and my energy, my strength. I'll put in my energy and my strength. I'll put in the natural and, and, but, but listen, not going to get anything done, not going to do any good unless God puts his super on top of my natural and it becomes a supernatural experience. <laughs> Otherwise, we're wasting grace. Humility is the key to receiving grace. Let me show it to you. You're there in the book of Hebrews. Turn one book back to the book of James. James chapter number four. And in James chapter number four, it gives us the key to receiving grace. If you want grace in your life, humility is the key. Let me show it to you. James chapter number four, verse number six. Look at what it says. But he gives more grace. Wait a second. I thought I got everything I needed when I got saved. Yes, you got everything you needed for salvation. But God wants to give you more grace. Oh, how about this? Please, sir, can I have some more? God says, yes. Yes, you can. What do you need? What are you going through? What are you experiencing? What's the trial you're facing? What's the goal? What's the job? My ability can get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. You need some more? Come on, come and get some more. He gives more grace. Well, how does he do that? How does he do that? But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That means that if you need grace in your life, 
Humble yourself. Depend on God. Totally rely on God. Got an issue? Bring it to God. Got trouble? Bring it to God. Got a need? Bring it to God. Why? Because as you bring that to God and say, God, I rely on you, I depend on you, Lord, by faith, I receive this gift of grace in this area in my life, and then you go out and you do your part, God will go out and do his part, and it'll get the job done. That's how this works. You say, how do you know it works like that? Salvation. You said, Lord, I can't save myself. I need you to save me. Therefore, by faith, I receive my salvation, and you are saved. In the same way, if you have a need, if you have a trouble, if you're in distress, same thing. Bring it to God. God, I, I, I can't do this on my own. Lord, I'll do my part. God, I'll do whatever it is you ask me to do. But God, unless you get involved, it's destined to fail. Therefore, God, I receive by faith, the grace that I need, and you watch what God does in your life. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Got to resist the proud. That means that when we go out and we think that we're all that and a bag of chips, God says, I'm not getting involved in that. I'm not doing nothing. I can't do anything with that because this is not about you. Oh, but I can read so much of the word. I, I can quote scriptures. I, can, I, I, I go to church five times a week. God's not impressed. God's looking for somebody who's dependent on him. The person who's going to church five times a week is the one that says, no, Lord, I'm desperate. I got to hear the word of God. I got to get a hold of this. God, I, I need you in my life. God, if, you, if I don't hear the word, Lord, I'm thirsty. God, I, I need, I, I want, I, just give it to me. God, pour it out on me, Lord. Love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, be not proud of race, face, place, or grace. See, sometimes people get a hold of the grace of God. They start to see things happening. All of a sudden, they think that they did something. Mm -mm. You didn't do nothing. God gets the glory. God gets the praise. God is the one who gets honored. God is the one that's lifted up. It's like the story in the Bible where Peter is... Speaking to this man by the name of Aenus. Aenus is bedridden. He's been there a long time. And Peter says, Aenus, the Lord Jesus heals you. This guy gets up completely healed. You know what happens? No one pats Peter on the back. No one lifts Peter up on their shoulders and dances around the city. No, they glorify God. That's how it should be. We can't do anything. Listen, I can't heal anyone. I can't do any of that. I can't save anyone. I, I'm nothing. God is everything. That's what this is about. And so as we humble ourselves, God pours out the grace on us. God just opens up the windows of heaven and just dumps it on you. Why? Because you're humble. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How do we halt the grace waste in our life? Second thing tonight, it, 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 all of these start with H, the letter H, by the way, just in case you were wondering. I just want to make that clear. Uh, how do we halt the grace ways? Number one is humility. Number two is holiness. Holiness. You, you're there in the book of James. Turn back to the book of Hebrews, but this time go to Hebrews chapter number 12. Just meditating on this. Holiness is so important for you and I. And you'll see why here as we read in, in, in Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 14 and verse number 15. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14 says this. It says, pursue peace with all people. And, now you remember and means what I just said about the previous thing. I'm also including this thing now. So pursue peace and the emphasis here is pursue this as well. So pursue peace with all people and holiness. Now look at what he says. Without which... No one will see the Lord. That's a pretty strong statement. That means that if you don't have holiness, you don't get to see the Lord. So how important is holiness to our lives? Well, if you want to see Jesus, you've got to get a hold of holiness. Plain and simple. Well, what is holiness? That's being exclusively God's. That's being separated and set apart 
exclusively for God. God is exclusively yours. You are exclusively his. So if you want to halt the grace waste in your life, yes, humble yourselves, depend on God. But secondly, holiness, separate yourself. Be exclusively God. Be completely his. Holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy his. Because that's what God wants from your life. Let's look at the next verse, verse number 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. So he was talking about pursuing peace with all men. And now he's talking about a bitterness that springs up that defiles many. See, holiness will affect your walk with God, but it will also affect your walk with other people. When you are exclusively God, now all of a sudden, instead of contaminating people with bitterness, now you are encouraging people with the peace of God. Why? Because you carry it around. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And if you are exclusively His, then the peace of God is resident within you because Jesus lives on the inside of you, and now you can pursue peace with all men. But isn't it interesting that he says, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. I oftentimes think of of this verse in track terms. If you've ever seen a high jumper come, right, and they run, and let's say this was the high jump bar right here. They come and they kind of, they do this weird run. Uh, Anybody seen the high jump, right? They do this run, and some of you track team members are like, it's not weird. Well, it doesn't look like how I run, so to me it's a little different, okay? So they come and they do this kind of, this little jump, right? And they're, they're, they're kind of prancing up to the bar. And then when they get right about here, they lunge and they, they just completely turn their body. And, and there's at one point, their legs get up over their head, right? And, and you wonder how they didn't touch the bar that whole time. And their body actually contorts backwards. And they do this backwards thing. You know, they press and then boom, they're up. And they go lean completely, totally upside down backwards. And then their legs straighten out. They fall on the mat. Now, what if they were running? And as they were running, somebody decided that they were going to take that mat and just move it just back a little bit, right? Just play a little, little game. And so here they come, and they're running, and they run up to it, and boom, they jump up, and they lean their entire person over that bar, and they come, and they fall short. What's that? That's bad news, right? Their back's going to be broken, or their neck, or something like that. See, that's the image I get of falling short of the grace of God. See, the grace of God is there to catch you. Grace of God, when you lean completely, when you get your whole person, when you get everything that you have up over and you are completely invested into it, head over heels, right, for the things of God. I mean, you, you, you just completely now have invested yourself into the grace of God. And when you do that, you are wholly his, exclusively his, and now all that you have is invested. The grace of God is there for you and I. Get a hold of this. So, how do we halt the grace waste? Number one is in humility. Number two is in holiness. Last thing for tonight is in hearing God. How do we halt the grace waste? We got to hear God. Got to listen for the voice of the Lord. We have to be attentive to his voice. I mentioned it earlier when I said that we need to be instantly obedient to the voice of the Spirit. There's been times where weird things have popped into my head. Kind of strange. Go buy that person a gift. Go tell this person Jesus loves them. Smile at this person. See, in our society, you walk up and you smile at somebody. They're thinking, what are you doing? Why are you smiling? Right? Right? See, God wants to put you on assignment. God wants you exclusively his for a purpose. God has plans. God has divine appointments. That's come up a couple times. I believe that, that God is not bound by time, but God in the fullness of time will bring things to pass. Uh, the best example of that is in Jesus, right? Right? 400 years of silence, and now all of a sudden here comes John the Baptist, and then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, the Bible says, born of a virgin, 
born under the law. See, there was a timing that Jesus had to come on the earth, and God was patiently waiting to bring Jesus in the fullness of time. Now, here on the earth, the body of Christ, God wants to bring Jesus here on the earth today. Did, did you hear that? God wants to bring Jesus here on the earth today through the body of Christ. Therefore, in the fullness of time, God will send you on assignment. God will bring you forth. And if you are exclusively his in holiness, and if you're totally dependent on him, then you are attentive to the voice of the Lord. And when he speaks, you hear and you do. And as you do God's will, God's way, you will never be lacking the grace of God. Sometimes people wonder, why, why, is it, why am I struggling? You know, I, I know this is a, a good thing. I know this is, you know, I see it in the Word. Why am I still struggling? Why is it hard? What's going on? Are you listening to the voice of God? Are you doing God's will not your way, but His way? Yeah. Growing up when I was in math class, I remember I, I used to be able to solve some problems without doing the proper procedure of the equation. And my teacher would come and he'd get mad at me and he'd say, Mr. Roth, I don't see the work here. And I'd say, but you see the right answer. <laughs> and he says, yes, you got the right answer. But you didn't solve the equation the right way. And when you get to the harder math, you're not going to be able to do it because you don't have the equation down the right way. Some of us are trying to get the God result without doing the work that God wants from us. Jesus lived and ministered in total dependence on the Father. Look at what Jesus says. John chapter 5. This is, this is good stuff for you and I. This is Jesus talking about himself. Jesus came and represented God to man, but he also represented what the perfect man is in himself. John chapter 5, verse number 30. Jesus is speaking in John chapter 5, verse number 30. And look at what he says. He says, I can of myself do nothing. Wait a second. This is Jesus. This is God in the flesh. This is the Son of God. What is Jesus saying? He's saying humility, total dependence on the Father. Look at what he says. I can of, of myself do nothing. Look at what he says. As I hear. As I hear. As I hear. We know Jesus was exclusively God's. We know that God had Jesus' full attention. As I hear, he was hearing the voice of God. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous. Because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. What is he saying? He said, I'm not out here doing this my way. Remember, Jesus said, Lord, I, I know what I'm going to there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in agony. He said, Lord, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But Lord, not my will. Yours be done. He was completely and totally submitted to the will of the Father, totally dependent. He clung to God all his days. He was empowered by the Spirit, and he was holy. He was exclusively God's. He was led into places he didn't want to go. Who wants to go be tempted in the wilderness by Satan himself? Who wants to be out there with the wild beasts? Who, who wants to be scorned and, and persecuted all of his days? Who wants that? Who wants to go and be crucified and go through that horrible, ungodly process? No one does. And yet, it was the will of the Father. And Jesus said, hey, I don't seek my own will. But the will of the Father who sent me. You're there in John chapter 5. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter number 14, verse number 10. Take a look at it with me. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Wait a second. Wait a second. The Father who dwells in me does the works. Now Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to live on the inside of each and every one of us. And the Apostle Paul, remember we had said, 
said, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. The Father who dwells in me does the works. So what does that mean? That means Jesus in his natural, physical body was listening and hearing the voice of God, was going out and doing the will of the Father, and he was giving glory to God. The Father who dwells in me does the works. You and I, as the body of Christ today, carry about in our person the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, and we have the grace, the ability, the empowerment of God. And therefore, if we're listening for God, then when we go out and we do those works, we realize it's not me. This is no longer me. This is no longer this. I don't get any praise. I don't get any glory. I don't get any honor. No, this is the Father who's working in and through me. Jesus is living his life in each and every one of us. Causing us to go forward and do good works in his name. Jesus humbled himself and was completely dependent on the Father for everything. How much more? How much more, you and I? If Jesus needed it, how much more do I need it? Sinful, stupid, poor, needy. My goodness. If Jesus, the King of glory, had to cling to the Father in humility, be completely and exclusively God's, and hear his voice, how much more should we, you and I, it's an amazing thing. Paul asked a very powerful question to the Corinthian church. I'll put it up on the overhead for you as we wrap up tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, and first part of verse 6. And it's in the New Living Translation. I like the way it said it in the New Living Translation. It's not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of his new covenant. How do we not waste Grace, how do we halt the grace waste that could go on in our lives? Number one, it's humility, complete and total dependence on God. We, we don't think we're qualified to do anything on our own, but we humble ourselves. Second thing is in hearing God. God's the one who qualifies. God's the one who calls. Therefore, we are exclusively his in holiness. And third thing is hearing God, being attentive to the voice of the Spirit and instantly obeying. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight if you got something from the Word of God. Hallelujah. God is good. God is so good. Hey, I want to mention to you guys, uh, we've been doing the, the year of the shout. We've got some weekly shout outs. Uh, we've got a, 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 the cards that you can get a hold of as you leave. I shook someone's hand today and I felt something really rough and rigid. They had a stack of these things. I was like, yeah, go get them, girl. You know, so she, she shook my hand you know, like this and I was like, wow. You know, so she had a stack of these. Please, go, go grab a hold of some of these. Invite someone to church and, uh, and just show them. There's a little website on there, shoutTheRock.com. And uh, even if you don't give them a DVD, the video of the DVD is on shoutTheRock.com. So make sure to get a hold of that. If you want to get a hold of one of these DVDs and show somebody, say, hey, this is what my church did in a quiet year. you got to check out what God was doing in a quiet year. Now they're shouting about the goodness of God, and they're moving forward. That's a great thing to do. And then as well, be encouraged. We've got the weekly shout-outs. And this week's shout-out is an amazing testimony just about what God, how God restored a couple. And that was, that was in debt, that was broken, that was uh, uh, just going through loss and, and a tough time, and, and, and specifically with their, their finances. And then they got down here, got into church, and, and started making the confession that we're about to make with our offering. And God completely and totally restored them. And you, you got to read the second page. It's two pages, all right? So, so they, they had a, a big shout, big long shout, but you've got to read how much debt was canceled on their behalf. It's, it's astounding when you read it, so I won't, I won't tell you. you got to go get a hold of it. It's on your way out on the pillars right in front of the bulletin, so grab a shout-out on your way out. And read about what happened in their lives because it'll encourage you. God's no respecter of persons. He can do it for them. He can do it for us. Amen? Amen. I want to make sure before you leave that you don't just encounter God and then it's all in vain. Empty ineffective and unproductive in your life. The Bible says that no man knows the hour of the day. Jesus is coming again soon. I don't know when he's coming. could be tonight. And so that's why it's all the more urgent that we talk about this. Because none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. 
Think about it for a second. What if? Just answer, just think about this in your heart. You don't have to, to respond or anything right now. Just, just kind of key in with God right now. What if this was your last night on earth? What if either Jesus came or you died, one or the other? But it was your last day on the earth. Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just think about that in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Some of you said, well, pastor, I, I think I would go to heaven. I think so. The problem with that is, could you show me in the Bible where it says you can think your way into heaven? Like I think, I think, and whoever's the most positive thinker, they get to go. It's not there. It's not about positive thinking. Some of you might have said, well, pastor, I really do hope I'd go to heaven. I hope so. But again, nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven. Like I hope, I hope, I hope, and whoever has the most hope, they get to go. It doesn't work like that. Some of you might have said, well, maybe I'd go to heaven. I, I really don't. No. Listen, you got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. So that means it's God's heaven. we got to get there God's way. Not going to get there your way. Not going to get there my way. Not going to get there some well-meaning church committee's way. And all roads don't lead to heaven, as some people would have you to think. Got to get there God's way. And don't you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who penned the plan of redemption carried it out in his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Don't you think that he would let us know how to get there? Well, he does. He does in his word. Some of you might be thinking, well, that's, that's good news because somebody told me that if I'm good, I, I get to go to heaven. I used to be bad. I've adjusted my behavior, and now I'm a good person, and, and I've been working on my resume for heaven, been doing a lot of good deeds, and, and I've helped people out. I, 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 was, I was giving my money to charities. I've been really nice to my neighbors. And I'm going to get to go to heaven because I'm good. The problem with that statement is that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven. This is not about you working your way into heaven as we discussed earlier. You, you can't get there by your good works. Why? Because your good works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. What does that mean? That means they're going to get thrown out. You're not going to make it there by being good. And the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. can't get to heaven just by being good. You can't be good enough because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. So he said, well, but wait a second. I was raised in church. Parents took me to church, called me a Christian. Had me baptized or christened as a child. They hung religious jewelry around my neck like a cross or St. Christopher. Took me to religious classes, Sunday school, catechism class, Sabbath school class maybe. And, and we're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven and denying hell, right? wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, check it out for yourself, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to go to heaven because you were raised in church and parents told you you were a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you are baptized or Christian as a child, wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, or you're born in America, that that qualifies you for heaven. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Word that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. Come on, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it if that's how you're trying to get to heaven. Some of you would say, but wait a second, not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am sitting in church right now. I go to church all the time. Uh, I'm sitting right here in front of you, Pastor. It's great, I'm glad you're here, but show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Any more than you can wear an angel's uniform, go down to Angel Stadium in Anaheim, put on your hat, wear the uniform, bring your bat and your ball, and think that you're going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They'll find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. Why? Because you're not a member of the angels organization. So what makes us think that we can sit in church, call ourselves a Christian, and that makes us a Christian? doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian. You get to go to heaven. Not there. Check it out. Some of you would say, well, okay, I understand that, Pastor, but not only have I attended church, I've been involved in church. My last church, I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things, but show that to me in the Bible, could you, real quick? Could, could you show me that in the Bible? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say get involved in church, sing in the choir, help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. Teach in the Bible classes, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't, doesn't work like that. 
And nowhere do I see in the Bible God's waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Simply doesn't work. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. I'm not going to make it. Some of you say, well, I got, I got that. I, I understand that. But, but listen, someone told me that if I knew God, that makes me a Christian. I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life. Sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you. Old and New Testament. It's great. Glad you did those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible? Where having head knowledge about who Jesus is makes you right with God and you get to go to heaven because of it? It doesn't work like that. Have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. They know who he is. The Bible says the devil himself knows God, can quote scriptures, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God and headed for heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for your heart. Jesus described it to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a good guy, did good things, raised up in his church called the synagogue. He attended there. He got involved there. He became one of the leaders there. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? This guy did good works in his community. People looked up to him to find out about God. And yet, when Jesus comes and speaks to this great man, who we would have thought was heading for heaven, he doesn't say, hey, Nick, man, whoa, great job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. But rather, what does he say to him? He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, I, I know our society has made a mockery out of that term. They've dragged it through the coals. And yet, what does the Bible have to say? Well, the Bible is very clear. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, being born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. If you haven't done that, then I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not saved. You're not going to make it. You've got to give God all of your heart and all of your life. How do I know it's all? Because Jesus came in the book of Revelation and he said, when I come... And he is coming soon, like we mentioned before. He says, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words for the mouth of Jesus. What is he saying? What's lukewarm mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Just like that. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang! When you hear that sound of my hands popping together, bang! That's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. But get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off for a second. Isn't it better to be in heaven with God because you were embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And ever, no one would make that trade. And yet, there's a temptation that I'm going to be embarrassed. I can't raise my hand. Listen, come on, move past that. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father and all the angels of heaven. Wow. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. You can get your hand up in the safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed. And even if you are, it's better. Or you can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God. Your call, your choice. I've done my job, loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's already done his job, sent Jesus beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart and will you give God all of your life? Will you reach out and take hold of that grace to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it? Come on tonight. Will you be born again?
Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, come on, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, you can make sure. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God by simply raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer or at the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. All together. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. Thank you. Four. God bless you. There's five up there. Anybody else real quick? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all your right. Five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. Ten over here. God bless you. If I already saw your hand, you can put it back down. Anybody else? There's ten wise people already. Who else tonight? You know you need to give God all of your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. I, I got you. Thank you up there. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Ten wise people already. If you're number 11, you, you think you should. Come on. You should. Go for it. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. All right, let's give the Lord a praise for 10 wise people. <laughs> Woo! So exciting. All right, all 10 of you are your number 11, number 12. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As we do that, if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here, all right? Nothing weird's going to go on. We just want to get you and pray with you, okay? So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. Let's all stand to our feet. You get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You just come right now. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Hallelujah, they're soul. coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is I'll your moment of salvation. For you alone. Every breath that I take. You can come too. Every moment I'm away. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise and welcome them as they come. All right, all right, everybody. Hey, look up here for a second. Do this. Put a big smile on your face, okay? Nothing weird's going on. You already got past the hard part. You got down here. Now it's cool, okay? This is the best decision of your entire life. I want to encourage you in that. Right over here to my right, your love. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave, this good-looking dude over here. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. He's just going to do three simple things and I'll let you know what they are in advance, okay? First thing he's going to do, he's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand, okay? You, God doesn't come into your heart and life because you need him. He comes into your heart and life when you invite him. He's a gentleman, okay? So he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again at that moment, okay? Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves getting free stuff. We love to give away free stuff. So that's a good relationship already, okay? Okay? A couple of booklets that our pastors wrote, a little simple reading that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? It'll just help you to get your bearings, okay? Now, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? Okay, you need to find out about that and invest a little bit of time. You know, we invest like hours into movies and video games and telephone conversations. You can invest maybe a half hour, sit down and read through the booklet and find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? Third thing he's going to do, he's going to offer you absolutely free what we call an SPT. What is that? Well, it's a spiritual personal trainer. Let me put it to you like this. It's a friend, a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Listen, I didn't grow until I had somebody come alongside me as a friend, teach me some things out of the Bible and show me how to be a Christian, okay? You have friends in the world, well, they're going to take you back to the world. A friend in church will help you to solidify that commitment and get you in a healthy habit of coming to church. That's what a spiritual personal trainer is all about. You heard about a physical trainer at the gym, Helps you get strong and buff, right? Spiritual personal trainer will help you to get strong spiritually so that you don't go back and serve the devil, but that you go on with Jesus. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go.